Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to Read Initiative. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Kelly Grillo. And we're speaking about her journey from, you know, how she did in school to where she is today. And I love listening to these stories because they give us a better idea of the who or how they were became the person they became. So Kelly, do you want to just, or Dr. Grillo, do you want to just take a moment and tell people what you do today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, I want to thank you for the podcast because it is amazing. Um, I don't know how many you have actually published to date, but I am enthralled and re-listen and listen and love some of the episodes with you and your mentors and even you sharing your own personal story. It's very inspirational. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing for the field and for people like me who I have to be reminded that it's okay to still be dyslexic and my skin. So um, that's a hard thing to do as a professional in this work. So I thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so what's your title and position today? Who are you? Well, so I wear many hats. So I'll first start with the fact that I'm a volunteer. So I'm a volunteer for the Indiana Dyslexia Association or IDA Indiana. Um, I'm currently serving as their president. And I feel so blessed to be able to do that work alongside passionate advocates, parents, people that are professionals in the field. And, you know, that work is probably the hardest work that I do currently. Um, you know, just the state of where we are at with dyslexia bills and, you know, the beliefs of parents versus the beliefs of schools. It's very challenging work. Um, my day job that actually, you know, puts food on the table and, you know, supports my husband and I with our children. Um, it is as a special education director. Um, so I've been in education for 23 total years um, and I've spanned everything from early learning. So the little babies, pre-K, developmental pre-K, all the way through college, professional studies, masters, and mentoring um, folks and serving as a mentor for folks that have disabilities going through a PhD program. So I've kind of done a little bit of all of it. And I've gotten the beauty and blessing, I would say, to do it in multiple locations. So I've lived in Florida. I've lived in North Carolina. I've lived in New Jersey. I've lived a little bit all over the place so that I've been able to see what our federal government and, you know, what their hopes and dreams were with IDA and how that translates to local policy in different states. And so that has impacted my work really greatly. Um, currently, I am living in Lafayette, Indiana, um, and I have the pleasure of sharing in this work with my husband, who is an amazing man who brought me here. But previously, I was in um, Florida and also volunteering constantly and working at, you know, the local level and school districts. Um, um, I started into leadership in education with one foot in leadership and one foot still in the classroom. And so I was able to still have my own caseload of kids and teach high school biology to struggling readers and writers, and then also be a part of the leadership team. So that was a really fun job that I got to do, kind of blending both things that I love. I always keep um, my pulse on the front line. So even though now I'm a special education director, I'm in classrooms constantly. I'm doing book studies with folks. I work with teachers directly. I tutor children. I always keep my pulse on what's happening in the work. I don't think people can respect you as a leader if you're not currently doing the work alongside them and supporting them. And so that's really where I'm most passionate. Um, but I've been a literacy coach. Um, I think a lot of the folks that you've had on had said it was the scariest job they've ever done in their whole entire life. Um, I do concur. Um, but I was very lucky to have been a literacy coach in the state of Florida. Florida, and they have the Florida Center for Reading Research, and that was just really emerging and supporting literacy coaches at that time in Florida. So I was very, very blessed. Um, and I have great mentors. So this work just, we collect each other, we find the people that are passionate doing the work and doing it, you know, happily. And we tend to let that energy launch us into doing the work a 
little bit deeper. And so I feel really, really blessed having the lens of being a dyslexic because I know the grave stakes that are at risk, right? I know what parents are experiencing inside the home during those private moments, but then also that lens of the, it, it's a heavy lift, it, the systematic wide push that it takes to make sure that, you know, Indiana just adopted 95%, right? They want 95% of all children reading by third grade. That's a huge and heavy lift because we're not near that right now. Um, but I think for our kids, we know that if we fail to remediate by grade four, there's so many social implications and there's an emotional implication and we don't want our kids to be mentally impacted and have those other adverse on top of an already learning difference. So that's really what fuels me in all of it, whether I'm volunteering or, you know, getting paid to do this work. <laughs> yeah, well, and the important thing to note, even if we get the student remediated and up to that, you know, grade level, it doesn't mean it still isn't hard. Yes. And I think, I think that's one of the, the things that um, is often forgotten like you and I are both at the point where we've established what works for us and we can get it done but that doesn't mean it's easy that no. doesn't mean it's the same as someone who doesn't have dyslexia being able to go through and do the work well, I laugh at that sometimes because, you know, this concept of motivation. So, mm -hmm. you know, people will say, oh, well, they're just not motivated enough. So a <laughs> sample example in my life, something that happened that really was upsetting to me. Um, I was highly motivated. I saw a really nice advocacy t-shirt and I wanted to purchase that t-shirt. I have my phone set up with all of my settings, my credit cards, my numbers, my all of the things that I use for accessibility. And so this particular vendor online, they didn't recognize those built-in features and I had to transcribe my address and I missed doing it. And so I kept watching the tracking number and I was like, why isn't this coming? They charged my charge card. You know, I am waiting for this great t-shirt. I'm so excited about it. So I had to literally recruit the aid of my husband and say, I need your help to look at this. And he said, you forgot to put our, our number of our home address. And I said, what? And he's like, yeah, you missed a whole component of our address. They can't deliver that package. Cause I'm like, it's been out on route and I'm watching like through the tracking and I'm like, why isn't this on our doorstep? It should have been here two days ago. And when I realized that my brain was filling in the part that I left out mm -hmm. and, you know, the postman couldn't bring that to my house, I was devastated. I literally had this moment where I had to slow my breathing and I cried and it's things that I, there was no motivation motivation in the world that could have changed that situation, my access to doing that properly wasn't there. And it doesn't mean that I'm not smart. And it doesn't mean that I didn't really want the t-shirt. I clearly did to the fact that we've purchased it a second time, but I do those kind of things all the time. And so my husband gave me the accommodation of saying, Hey, look, it's ordered. A second one is ordered and it's on its way. Now, might I have to eat 30 bucks? I might, but that's I pay the price of my dyslexia every day because certain fillable forms are not accessible to saved and, you know, pre-filled activities in our devices. They're, they're considered locked or encrypted and they don't let us do that. So when, when we're doing things that are very meaningful to us, there's still barriers. So it is hard. My job is hard every day. I advocate for my use of accommodations but sometimes I don't always think it's appropriate to, you know, put my screen reader on or have my calendar read a number back to me. So there's things in which I have to just say, hey, do you mind repeating that out loud? Like I have to have people do that for me. And at this point, at being a 45 year old woman who has been very successful with lots of supports and over time, um, the shame that I felt or those tragedies that have like accumulated, 
I still feel those things. So I get overwhelmed and I cry and it's devastating and I can't get my words out and, and I'll come home and be reflective with my husband in a very safe place and say, this happened today. Or, and I don't think people understand that it happens constantly. It doesn't stop happening. I just have a better mechanism of coping with it. Um, but my dyslexia is never going to go away. And it's at the severe level. I mean, I, I'm very lucky to be a reader. Um, I didn't learn to read until very, very late. And with lots of different interventions and methodology, it doesn't mean that I still don't need reading support today. I can decode, I can read words, but when I need to process large bodies of information in a swift way, I definitely need supports to do that. And it would be really respectful if somebody is trying to, you know, support me in a way that doesn't make me feel shame to stop every once in a while and give a review of what's happening or have that agenda in advance or give a synopsis of what we talked about last time at a meeting. Sometimes people don't feel like they should have to do that. If you're supporting me, you're probably supporting everybody else that's really, really busy too. And we're going to become an, a better and more effective team if we're putting those things down for everyone. And so, you know, I advocate for those things from the start. Uh, you know, schools are looking at like universal design for learning and how to be more inclusive at large. Those things are really meaningful and it helps the brain to keep cognitive load down so that you can keep thinking clear. You know, the things that in, in which are helping me, they're helping everybody. And so if the, the name of the game is to change the brain, right? <laughs> um, so we want to change how the brain is able to process information. We're going to want to keep that frontal lobe that controls impulsivity and speech, you know, as least burdened in the process. And so, you know, using those visuals, using those supports where next we're going to, or we just did this and now we're going on to that, that's going to help a kiddo with autism, but it's also helping me to keep my my executive functioning and my needs, you know, where we're going in this learning plan. So it's that idea of us being diverse and serving all diverse learners with appropriate and high leverage strategies. It truly does help everyone. Um, I'm very, very blessed that I had very formal training from the University of Central Florida um, at a time that they were recipients of grants from the Office of Special Education Programs in DC, so OSEP. Um, so I've not been trained once, but twice on different OSEP funded grants. So I've gotten the ability to really get deep inside some of those routines and those strategies and to see research being collected on those things and to see what profiles of brains respond. And the more I got to learn about those things, the more I realized how my brain worked. So mm -hmm. it was really fun to see like, oh, well, why did verbalizing and visualizing by Linda Mood Bell help me? Oh, it's because visual imagery strategies out of like um, Kansas, University of Kansas, they do a lot of content enhancement routines. That helps me because I'm able to see a mental picture picture, draw the language onto that picture and help to then fill in all of those pieces where I'm most disabled. But once I do that activity, I have that information at a very high level of recall. And so if you're just giving me all of the verbal and none of those visual imagery pieces, I'm never gonna be able to get there with comprehension. So even though I can decode and I can read at the sentence level, and if I cannot visualize what's happening, like I don't see a, a movie in my mind. And I never realized that. The first book that I had ever read was late in the eighth grade and it was Old Man in the Sea. Um, and I could recall the, the scene in my mind. I have never seen the movie, but where he's like grappling with the fish, you know, like it's this big, horrific, very sensory detail. But I remember using all those strategies that I have been learning at Linda Mood Bell. And I was like, oh my gosh, I called my dad at work at the time I lived in New Jersey, um, in Pensacola, New Jersey, if there's any people from New Jersey out there. Um, but so I called my dad, he'd worked in Philadelphia for the transit authority septa and i said dad oh my gosh i saw it and he's like what like and it was this big exciting event for me but i said i saw a movie in my mind and it was 
awesome. And it was so motivating to me. I couldn't wait to read the next chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter, but that was very late. So, you know, thinking through kindergarten through, you know, mid year of my seventh grade year, never having that ability to automatically see the pictures of what's happening in text. That is a very late time for that to happen. Most kids can tell you and draw between the lines, or if there's no pictures in books, they can kind of be that movie director and tell you how they would have, you know, made the cake decorated if you're reading a book about a birthday. I couldn't do that. And I don't understand why I couldn't do that. And even now, I don't prefer to read um, fiction. I really cannot stand fiction. It's very hard for me to read. I get exhausted. I can only read it very slowly. Um, I use a screen reader and I have to use it on a slower pathway than the regular speaking voice so that I can make sure I'm getting those pieces. Um, but when I read nonfiction, I read it at two times the rate. So like if I listen to the podcast, if it's a 40 minute podcast, I'm listening in 20 minutes and I'm able to take all of that in because I'm used to processing verbal words words at double the rate that most people's brains can take it in. If you listen to my books on tape, it sounds like another language. <laughs> um, it doesn't sound like someone speaking English. People are like, what? You can understand that? And I really do. And I I prefer it, um, but I do prefer, prefer a bimodal interaction. Like I prefer to see the words and hear the speaking. Um, and I don't mind if it's a computerized voice. Some people say in the research that it's better to have a human voice. That's why we have both Bookshare and Learning Ally. Um, but really it's up to how you process. If I'm gonna listen to fiction, I do use a human voice or an audio book like on Audible. Um, um, if it's all nonfiction, I want that choppy digital voice with no inflection and no emotion because I'm really using a different part of my brain. And so um, there's not a lot of research when it comes to that. And so people will randomly make the choice for a student instead of making them have access to all types. And then for them to become truly automated and fluent with all types to choose for them. And that's really what we should be doing is involving the learner as what mode. Yes. Definitely. 100% essential. Yes. And I want to take you back to that speeding up and speeding down thing. Because yes, it is excellent when we're listening to audiobooks, but it's also important in the classroom because there are so many instances where, I mean, it's, it's student dependent and situation dependent, but if you don't understand the student's needs, then you can frustrate them even more. And when I was speaking uh, with a, a formal head of a school specializing in dyslexia, I really liked how she framed that they taught their students instead of just saying they don't get it, saying repeat or reframe. It's funny. I train students to say, I'm sorry, to raise their hand and say, I'm sorry. Can you tell that to me in a different way? Yes. And the students that use that strategy really end up connecting with what is being spoken about. So either it's something in my language, I didn't pick up the, the, the word that you were saying properly. Um, I So in, with my dyslexia, I absolutely do word substitution. Um, I need to use, like you put the captions on for me, so thank you. Um, but I don't always process spoken language in the way in which, you know, I should be hearing it. So I make those easy substitutions, the voiceless and, you know, the un, or the voice and the unvoiced syllables and things like that. And it's not easy. A certain patterns really are hard for me. So I'll have to say to someone, can you look at me? And they're like, you're not deaf. Why, why are you making me look at you and talk, but all of the strategies that help our colleagues and, and our friends with, you know, deaf, hard of hearing needs, they help me as well. And, and in a classroom, what, what I find is if you ask somebody to repeat themselves and, or if you ask them to, or I don't understand, or a lot of times they think that you're not intellectually engaged or you're not smart. So they just slow their verbal pattern and that's not what I'm asking at all. And usually if you're talking slow, I'm bored and I check out. 
So I need that modulation, prosody, intonation, whatever you want to call it, to fluctuate across time. So in a co-taught situation, let's say, it's really good for your speakers or your teachers, if you're truly team teaching, to I'll take the first five minutes, then change the vocal pattern to someone else. Um, there's a lot of research on the brain's excitement and re-engagement with different tones. Um, they do stuff within music. I laughed the other day. I realized there's so many special education folks that are also really deeply into music. And I thought they probably bring all that skill into what we do. But um, it's fun to watch some of the research. The big songs in the summer have the same kind of melodic tone that if you put them in a synthesizer, you can see the patterns. And so I know the patterns that work for me, but teaching kids about their brains and the pattern, the speed, if they prefer a female speaking voice or a male voice, all of those things matter. Um, my personal son, he um, he's an avid reader. He loves to also um, process texts by, you know, reading with his ears and he loves to put a British voice on and we're in America, right? And so I call him an eglophile. I'm like, oh, Carver, you know, you're so into, into like that British culture, but he's like, mom, I love it. It's for some reason, it's the way in which my mental speaking voice in characterization, characterizations and stories, how it's working in my brain. He goes, and I'm more engaged with it. So I remember more. So I think that's the, the engagement piece around the brain science is what we've got to really take a deeper look at, you know, and, and that going back to this idea of slowness. So in my dissertation research, I did um, direct student interview about my intervention and it was a vocabulary intervention. But so I directly interviewed the students and I watched in my film and in the um, transcription, the time, all of the interviews would take less than 15 minutes. You know, the kids were choosing to do this interview with me. They were high schoolers. They were giving up either a study hall or a lunch or maybe before after school and we were sitting in a little closet basically and I would record them. What I realized, and this is terrible, but I reflected in a paper later about the idea that when people have a speech impairment or if they're slow in their speech because they're gathering time for a word, maybe because they suffer from apraxia, which I do. Um, if they're looking for something to give you a more precise answer, they'll slow their pattern of speech. What we do, and I uncovered my own latent biases, like I care about these kids, I want them to do well, but I noticed the timestamps that I was hurrying along the students that didn't speak at my preferred rate of engagement. And so for teachers and for adults and educators and just for all of us as, as communicators, it's really important that we keep our own biases in check when it comes to speech or even students that may use assistive technology or AAC devices or any kind of communication support because they're not intellectually impaired. It's a communication impairment. So we want to make sure that we're giving enough wait time for them to fully engage and reward that full engagement with being respectful and talking to them on your normal rate. Because what we tend to do is we slow our speech patterns thinking that there's a cognitive problem and there's not. So we have to make sure that we're not like mirroring the slowness just because it might take them a little while to get the word out. Um, because I would sit in classes sometimes, I remember in middle school and I would look and loathe at some of the teachers that did not treat me with the same peer type interaction that they were doing with another student without an impairment. So I would sit there and just like decide I didn't like them and it had nothing to do with their content or, but it was because of how they were in interacting with me because I might've paused long to find a vocabulary word or a word that I was looking for to describe something. Or I might turn to somebody and say, you know, that thing that I, I use that a lot searching for the word. I'll say, you know, when, or, and it's almost like I'm playing an active game of charades when I cannot get the, the word on the tip of my tongue. Um, what I think it's done for me, though, for my career working with students that struggle, modeling the recovery of when I cannot and saying, you know, it's, it's okay because I know I'm smart and like kind of sharing with them in that 
look, we got over this hump because, you know, there, there are daily struggles and they need to know, like, it's okay to feel a little inadequate right now, get over the hump and then celebrate. Like, look, we got to the word you were looking for. Um, I think that's really awesome for students because I did not have that. I did not have teachers that were outwardly disabled and would share with my family. My mom was uh, dyslexic. She could speak multiple languages, but she couldn't read in any language and she died a non-reader. And so it was very shaming. She didn't come to IEP meetings. Um, she didn't feel truly welcomed whenever there was something print. Um, you know, they would send stuff home to say, you know, read this with your child. I'm lucky I had a nine-year-old or sister who um, she would read with me because my, my mother couldn't be reading and my dad worked two jobs. So I think it's really important for us as educators to kind of celebrate those things, especially when we have kids on the hook, because a lot of times when kids speak up for themselves, they're either not recognized. You know, we say advocate, advocate, advocate. I advocate for myself. And you say, yeah, I can't give you a set of notes because that's cheating. It's like, well, then why tell me to advocate? Because when I do, nobody listens. <laughs> um, so there's that. And then the other piece of that is, is trying to find mentees and mentors because it is very isolating, especially in those middle school years. Um, when I was 12, I tried to take my own life and it's something that usually I can't talk about without getting very emotional, but I, um, I didn't want to live because of learning. <laughs> and that otherwise I was a happy, happy kid. And I was always full of life singing and dancing. I'd always sing the wrong lyrics because I didn't process what was actually being said. Like um, the, my favorite one to say, like for epic fails for song lyrics is goodbye fruity toothpaste um, instead of goodbye ruby tuesday <laughs> so i really thought that they were singing about fruity toothpaste and so if you know anything about you know, substitutions you would say that my brain definitely was processing the wrong phoneme <laughs> but i i kind of laugh at that a lot but i do it all the time um even there was a justin bieber song last year and i swore it was saying um hit you like a truck stop and my husband's like that wouldn't make sense like we're not gonna be married and have fall in love and it hit you like a truck stop what are you thinking and saying I don't know so I love um, lyrics A to Z or Apple music you can like watch the words on the, the captioning and so I tend to get the words a little bit better now <laughs> when I sing along I love to sing um, I, I mentioned music already I don't sound good when I sing um, I just I love it and so middle school instead of giving me pull out speech they gave me consult speech and worked with my middle school choir teacher and so in choir, you're doing vocal training and you're, you know, mommy made me mash my M&Ms. Well, that's pretty great if you pair it with a, with a print and you can kind of watch and learn a little bit more deeply the way language works. And so with um, choir, I, I did choir, show choir, all that, but um, Christine Jones, she's amazing. She's still my friend to this day. And she's a beautiful singer. She's an opera singer. She lives part of her year in um, Belgium and part of her year in um, Ocala, Florida. And so I would, during um, one time of the year, try to see her every year, but she was amazing. So she was my middle school and then um, she did a little bit of work at the high school, um, but she was a really strong person in my life that could help support me. And I joke with her because early middle school, like sixth grade, um, there was a lot of crying in the bathroom and I would cut class and hide in the bathroom, but she knew it. And it was her prep period, the period that was most challenging, which would have been English for me. And so she would have these great talks with me and build me up and tell me how smart I was and that she gets to see all of these great things in me. But um, it takes typically five people in your life. If you can count five folks in your life that also feel that, you know, our parents have to love us and say we're strong and smart and all this. So we tend to not, to not believe them when we're struggling. Um, and, you know, my dad is a wonderful advocate. I mean, he really is an amazing human being. He would always show me like how I'm just as smart as my other, you know, friends or whatever. Um, but you have to hear that from your parent. Hearing it from somebody you love is like, yeah, whatever, right? But then to hear like an English teacher say, wow, you wrote this poem and it is amazing. Yeah, it had spelling errors, but 
this poem was amazing. Um, so I, I did a lot of writing by myself, but I would never let anybody look at it. And so I remember when, I think it was like in the nineties when the Exxon, Exxon Valdez um, oil spill happened and it was like a world crisis. Everybody was so upset. And I was taking a science class at the time and I wrote a poem all about it. And I used a pun and I used the word C like S E A and C the kind like with your eyes S E. And the, the teacher was like, this should be published. This is so good. And so, I mean, in the areas where we struggle the most, and I think it was Anna Thorsten on um, Twitter, she lives in Tennessee and she is also dyslexic. She's like, where our gifts are could be our largest struggle. And so I've always kept that with me. And I, I struggle. I mean, I wrote a 234 page dissertation in three years. Like I, I did my whole PhD study in three years, maintained straight A's, did the status, you know, stats classes and, you know, got stuck on words like skewness and kurtosis, but worked through it and loved all of it. And, um, you know, my dissertation chair, her name's Lisa Deeker, Dr. Deeker. And she was like, Kelly, you earned two PhDs because you had to work double as hard as anybody else. And I had to read everything twice. And so I would read it with my ears and then read it with my eyes and make sure that I had all of the things that I needed in order to thrive in the class discussions. And, but um, I, I just work really, really hard. When you work hard and it's working, people love you. When you work hard and it's not working and you don't get the praise, you feel so alone. And so that's why I really, I try to share with teams to do that mentor mentee piece because you can't have someone feel that alone for that long and hold on. And so, you know, the adults that love you have to love you. But if you have a, a peer, a, a colleague, um, you know, to admit that you're dyslexic in this arena is hard because will people look at my papers when they're, you know, um, un anonymous and peer reviewed a little closer for the spelling errors or like there's always going to be an error. I hire great, great um, editors but there's always going to be an error when I'm, because I'll think of something last thing, the editor's gone. It's I got to upload today and I'll rewrite a whole section because my passion is that I want this to be perfect. And my idea wasn't yet perfect. So I'll write a section over and I'll turn it in without an extra set of eyes. And so guess what? There's going to be a couple spelling errors or the greater than or less than signs going to be turned inside out. And even when I do pay people, they miss things as well. So, you know, I, I have an error in a published paper that kills me to this day. Every time I read it, I like find the error right away. So I think we just have to like be a little forgiving of ourselves, of course, but if our, the culture of our community, these would shift and people would really deeply understand that dyslexia is not a cognitive impairment. Um, I've had a lot of people say, you're so smart. How do you need an accommodation? And so they negate, like, you can be so smart, twice exceptional even. And I am twice exceptional. I never knew that until college. Like, I was just like, what, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, but I have such large splits in my, my individual batteries that certain things are just so, so hard. And so I think we just have to be more um, transparent about what it means to be dyslexic and what our struggles were. The fact that I kicked people and bit people and ran home from school. Um, I wrote, um, Valentine's Day cards when I was a little older and I was suspended from school because they thought I was being naughty because I told boys that I would lick them. And I meant to write the word like, but nobody really thought, oh yeah, that's right. She's reading impaired. They thought I was just being naughty because that's what middle school kids do and they act fresh and start talking about sex, but I was not. And so I think, you know, giving some grace and knowing who's in front of you and getting um, more to the bottom of things. Like I would get rapid fire questioning from principals or whatever. And when I'm stressed, I can't talk. So yeah. they say, well, you're not talking. So therefore you must be guilty. And so, I mean, my husband wrote a blog that was amazing. Um, right before the COVID shutdown, we were going to um, Oregon for the CEC conference. And I was actually winning teacher of the year for national CEC. And so we, I have a pass so that I don't have to take 
take off my shoes and undo all this stuff. And so I have the, um, the frequent flyer, whatever safe flyer program. And so I can't think of more. <laughs> it's pretty funny, but, and he did not. So he was in the regular like TSA check kind of thing. And I was able to walk through Well, a gentleman in a wheelchair came through. So I stepped to the side because that's what you should do. You should be polite and let somebody aside that needs a little more assistance than you might need. Well, I stepped in a restricted area and an officer came and was like screaming at me and I couldn't get any words out. And I had my phone and the lady had already checked my pass and my phone wasn't recognizing my face to unlock it. And I couldn't remember my code and he was yelling at me more to open my credentials and I couldn't. So tears were flying out of my face. Then I end up in a side room and getting frisked. And so I'm like, I'm not a terrorist. I promise like <laughs> I'm supposed to be here. But um, my husband was just like, I cannot believe this happened. We almost missed our flight because I couldn't get speech out of my mouth when I needed to be able to. So I just, I think we have to really educate people about dyslexia and all the impairments and the comorbid impairments like ADHD and um executive functioning. And, um, I mean, there's a plethora of comorbid, um, impairments that go along with dyslexia. And then the, the really big one for me is the anxiety. Um, I, I'm so anxious, even as an adult, I'm always afraid of missing a meeting, um, going way too early for a meeting, making people feel uncomfortable because I'm over planning for a meeting. Um, I get very, very anxious because I want to do my job right. I want to do it on time. I want to please people. I'm a pleaser. And that, that formula of being dyslexic, high performing and a pleaser creates instant and anxiety in my life. And so if you think about a young kid who is anxious about, I I ask my, my husband every single day, what day is it? I, he's like, you just asked me that. I know what day is it? He's like, baby, it's Wednesday. Okay. Do you have class tonight? So I'm always scripting. So I'm going over what's happening first, second, third, fourth. So those schedules up on the board, the teachers can do those advanced organizers. Again, a uh, uh, really good strategy out of the um, University of Kansas is content enhancement routines. You can give a unit organizer, you can give a lesson organizer. They're all very well researched. And these organizers down to like even a language organizer, they allow the brain to make sense of very messy details and keep things organized. And so if you gave me a course organizer on the first day of high school class, and then each of the six units, I'm going to get a a unit organizer. And then at the beginning of every other week, every two weeks, I'm going to get a lesson organizer. And each of these things are going to have a prompt, the important vocabulary. It's going to have organization so that I can even self-test um, and I know what the learning objective is, maybe even resources to find tools. I have found going through the training of that content enhancement routine, it's um, again, a really long, gregarious process and I didn't get that out right. <laughs> But it took me two years with a co-teacher to be very highly skilly trained. And we unpacked the whole entire um, course of biology because high school kids, the pathway to graduation is algebra and biology. They usually need a, a science and in all of the states and territories, we say biology um, and then as well al- algebra. So they're kind of the gatekeepers of if you can exit with a standard diploma. So I worked real, real hard with teams of folks to unpack and make sure that any kid coming into that setting could in fact not just learn, but learn to a very high degree and feel brilliant, whether they're readers or non-readers and whether they had good executive functioning or not using all of these tools. Because if me as the teacher is highly organized and I know where the end point's going to be and I backwards plan, I'm going to be able to support all of those learners. So I kind of think about RTI or that multiple tiers of systems of support, putting curriculum through that tiered system, figuring out, I usually cite Sharon Vaughn's work of the some most all pyramid. And so what will some kids need? What will most kids need? What will all kids need? Or what do you expect all kids will learn? 
incidentally even, like maybe we talk a lot about global warming now, maybe that's going to be something easy because it's around in, in the environment. Science, you know, it lends to math, reading, and all the areas because the language and biology from my research, um, it's by far way harder even than a first year Spanish class. The, by, the language alone is something that kiddos that struggle to learn, they need that language unpacked and supported and broken down and chunked and ways to remember it. So all of those routines are really amazing. It's what helped me. Um, again, my, my dad's great advocate. So he actually revoked my IEP so that I could have a pathway into harder classes because where I grew up, it was kind of the gatekeeper to advanced classes. And he knew that I was smart. And he's like, you know what? You need to be about around the best kids that are thinking in the best ways and have the best strategic networks to think through learning and processing and see what the best learners are doing. You don't need to be in a self-contained class around the, the biggest strugglers, especially because when we put all kids into one class, we call it the multi-BE approach or that varying exceptionalities all in one class. One, the teacher cannot by themselves in isolation be skillful enough to teach every student, no matter what disability is on their IEP or what their learning needs. By sheer volume of how you can manage your day as a teacher, if you are a K to five teacher and you have all of those kids, there's no way you can be the end all be all one, one person. So we have to really team it in, make sure that's, that's really why the least restrictive environment is talked about, because even if you perceive I'm not benefiting from this instruction, me hearing and seeing and processing what's happening in the environment can be pre-wiring my brain so that later when I am ready, you know, that power of yet. I might not be ready yet, but later, if you've pre-wired and you've primed the pump, let's say, um, my brain's going to be more available to recognize. It takes anywhere from five to seven exposures. And for very impaired people, they need on upwards, right? So the more impaired you are, the more rehearsals you need. Um, a very with it, you know, um, somebody that has no learning difference, that learns very easily, they might even need two exposures. So um, there's a rule that I, I don't know where this comes from. Um, Dr. Rebecca Hines always talked about it at the University of Central Florida, but it's called five plus or minus two. So if a student is bright and learns very quick, you might only need to give them three exposures. You give them two and you then reinforce it to make sure they have it with a third, right? If they're really impaired, no less than seven exposures. It's also kind of why we chunk numbers the way we do, like with a three digit area code. And, you know, I can't remember my own phone number. I speak a lot nationally and I tell people my phone number because I, it's an acronym. So um, in Daytona Beach, Florida, the, the area code spells FUN 383. Mm -hmm. And then my middle digits, it's the three, eight, the three, so three, eight, three. And then it's my birthday, 0977. Because if I had to remember my phone number, like many kindergarten students have to, to get like out of kindergarten, I almost failed kindergarten because of that. Um, I could not for the life of me remember my phone number. Um, but so that pattern and with a riddle or a rhyme, I can get to, but um, I joke with people now because my, my husband, his, I, I don't know his phone number. If my phone died, I couldn't reach him. We ride motorcycles and on my motorcycle, he has a tag that has his phone number in case something happens, in case my phone goes dead and that I need somebody to help me to contact him if we get separated on the road. So I think it's really important for all of us to kind of think, you know, once you're dyslexic and you become a reader, it doesn't make you not dyslexic. You're not cured, right? Um, so it's a lifelong impairment. And I just have gathered lots of tools and I've been afforded a lot of amazing research-based intervention and also to learn it from the lens of becoming a, a, 
high quality teacher. And so I feel like as that arc had happened, you know, I've learned more and more and more strategies for myself. And I feel a little stingy sometimes. (laughs) Like I wish every dyslexic can have this level of training because it does, it feels um, unfair. I often say, I don't want to be the only person at the table um, with all of this knowledge and skills. I want many people like me to be accessing at a high level, you know, their PhD studies and be not fearful or or feel shame and access the accommodations that they need. Um, You know, I, I never could imagine my mom is now passed. Um, but I think I would make her really, really proud. Um, she had a really hard time knowing that like genetically the disposition of me being really dyslexic, one of three children, my brother, my sister learned how to read really easily. And, um, they are very bright people and don't struggle. I mean, I was always kind of the laughing stock. Like I would say the most bizarre things and we'd be driving on family vacation. And I'd say, you know where I really want to go. I want to go to the Bahamas. And I could not get the B out to say Bahama. And they were like, really Kelly, you want to go to Bahamas? And they would like tease me and And, you know, those things, like I would sit in silence and kind of cry. It felt really horrible having siblings that always felt like they teamed up on you. And, you know, when I started my studies at Rutgers, I came home from a psychology class. I was a psychology major. I started out pre-med and I quit because I had a horrible instructor that was not good at accommodating, even though I had accommodations. Um, And she was very unhappy that I made the highest um, score on a chem lab and she threw my paper at me and told me it wouldn't happen again. I was the only girl of this cohort and it was pretty terrible. Um, So I changed my major (laughs) and tried to find a major that was more gentle about difference. And so I landed in psychology and um, I came home all excited with this stat about, you know, nearly a third of the population, human population could have impairments. And I said, oh my God, you know, that's a huge number. I was very like shocked that a third, that's a huge number. So an impairment in some way, shape or form. And my dad looked at me and he goes, Kelly, that's right. Because I have three children and you're impaired. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, like every, like every time I thought I was like making these huge breakthroughs and being fully accepted, even those jokes, I don't think people understand coming from the people that love you the most, it hurts the deepest. And so, you know, being who I am now, if things happen, I will confront them and talk to them and say, it really hurts me when, you know, and share those pieces. But as a kid, I didn't. And so it's really super important during those developmental years to make sure that we're not isolating people that feel already isolated. Um, It was very, I I sang to myself. We had a huge skylight and our bathroom echoed. I would lock myself in the bathroom for hours on end and lay in an empty tub and stare at the skylight and the, the chain links and sing as loud as I could and daydream and imagine things and be in my own headspace because being anywhere else was very painful. And so like even things like hopscotch, like drawing a hopscotch, I could never remember the pattern. Um, I jumped double Dutch and I was pretty good at it, but I couldn't, I couldn't spin the rope. So um, I could get into the rope and jump, but I couldn't spin the rope. I couldn't get the pattern. And so a lot of those things, I don't think people understand how it bleeds into everything. And um, I'm very, very blessed that I have a husband now, but I was married before. And dyslexia is very hard on family relationships. And there's a lot of miscommunication and there's a lot of things. And so I tend to turn within myself and I close everybody out because I don't have a problem communicating with myself. (laughs) Um, But communication is really hard with other people because I think I'm telling you parts of a full story, but I'm only giving you a part that it doesn't make sense to you. So you have to say, hold up, Kelly, go back. What happened before this? So my husband will say, you just came in mid sentence. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm not in your head. So he'll slow me down to go back. 
So I, you know, and then I'm not good at telling you key details, like the gist of something. I tell you the whole story and maybe far too many details because I don't know how to pick the ones that I feel are most important for you to feel my story. And so he'll say, oh my gosh, you got to tell me the whole thing. Or just, so sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes it's too much. I mean, it's so our kids do that too in their writing. Like they'll get a prompt and sometimes they'll do far too much. And you're like, what is this disorganized mess? Right. But then other times they can't even get a sentence on the paper because either fear or they just are not fully comprehending what the prompt is asking or the relationship. You know, we talk a lot about connected texts and multiple sources and well, that's a really high level skill. And without some kind of coaching graphic organizer, or like when we think of the gradual release model, if you've not modeled really intensely and with purpose and tools for someone to write to multiple texts and maybe a, a piece of audio, I mean, cause that's what we're asking of kids, right? Um, it is almost impossible because the brain wants to make sense of things, but the way the dyslexic brain makes sense of things it doesn't simply make sense to anyone else. And so, you know, supporting that idea of a funnel, like how do we funnel these ideas to a point that makes sense? So a lot of people talk about Scarborough's rope. Yeah. The reading rope doesn't make sense to me. It's very um, pieces everywhere. I've redone that into a funnel because all of that it makes better sense because it's like coming out together. Like, so there's just some, like the simple view of reading that makes perfect sense that we would have decoding plus language comprehension, equaling reading comprehension. But I get very overwhelmed with Scarborough's rope and it's a genius piece of work. Don't, no doubt. I'm not criticizing it, but for this dyslexic, it is so much to take in. So if you're new in your, your structured literacy approaches, or you're new in the science of reading, looking at that all together is very overwhelming. And I would probably want to shut down a conversation. If I didn't learn any of that, I would probably get a little defensive. So like kind of thinking about bite-sized pieces, like that's why I like those trends of like morphology Monday, fluency Friday, like how can we think about a rope and weave in pieces of structured literacy to show people that they can do something to support all learners and do it successfully and then keep layering over time. So I, you know, I try to think about how, you know, my brain works and how I get on, you know, cognitive overload and how can we help for, for practitioners that have no time to pause and reflect? How can we help them to better serve students like my brain, right? So, you know, bite-sized pieces would also work. A lot of the things that we are asking of them to do with students, we need to be doing, you know, getting, getting alongside, getting support under, you know, not really, not shaming. I mean, we don't want to shame our learners, so we don't want to shame anyone in this. Um, So I, I do think a lot of that perspective for me helps me to be a better teacher educator, um, helps me to kind of add that lived experience to say, well, these parts were really challenging for me. And here is the story or the acronym or the way in which my brain can recall it so that it makes meaning for me to be able to implement. And so I do, I think my, my curse, my, you know, my dyslexia, especially with how extreme it is, is also very much deeply a gift. And so I, I wouldn't change it. Um, there's parts, there's parts of the story I would change. Um, I probably wouldn't have bit an SLP's finger. <laughs> um, I, she was very upset and she was pointing at something, trying to get me to do it. And she was mad because I had done it the last session. And so she was very not happy with me. And I just got closer and closer to the table. And I think I growled at her. So I think I did give a cue that I was going to maybe do something to escalate. And then she prompted one more time and I did, I bet I bit the tip of her finger. And so I didn't mean to do that. I don't have a mental like disorder or a behavioral disorder. I just was frustrated. And so when you lose language, you act out and you try to escape and you do it in any method it takes. So I hit kids with rocks. I punched a girl in the face. Uh, She was a very good reader and I wasn't. And so what do you do on the schoolyard? You're going to do things that are not 
kind and nice. And I've grown. I don't do that now. Um, but I, I have to hit my pause button. You know, I hit that like frontal lobe, try to control speech and my impulsivity. Um, and a wonderful colleague of mine made me a bracelet that says pause. She happens to be an SLP. Um, my speech language people are my favorite people. I love language and I keep them very close. But I, I think we have to have far more compassion for everybody in this um, and truly for families, for parents. A lot of this impacts the family so deeply. Um, disability really rips families apart. It's hard to have a happy and harmonious family if school's calling all the time about your struggling learner. Um, and then if you're trying to take on the role of school, it really is disruptive um, in a really horrible way. Um, you know, my dad felt a lot of shame because he values education and he made sure all his kids were at school. And if we needed to go to private education, sometimes we went to private school. Um, so I grew up in Philadelphia in Kensington and there's a little public school that wasn't really helping much. And so my dad put me in the, the Catholic school right across the way. And so all of us ended up at that Catholic school because he wanted the family all together. Um, but so, I mean, I think, you know, parents try their best and when they're trying everything they think is the right thing to do and they're still getting negative feedback you know it's hard to keep it together so I mean my my dad then took reading into his own hands and over the word if one evening at the table sounding out if, if, over and over he's like what is it what is it and I looked at him with big eyes and I was overwhelmed and I had no understanding this too you know, sound word, if I couldn't say if I had no schema for what if meant where it held in my lexicon orthographically, I had no understanding of what the role of this word was. So without my brain having the ability to make sense of it, I don't encode it and I can't use it. And so he says to me, what is it? And I turned around and I said, it he beat the living crap out of me. And my dad never really beat me much, but he was at the end of his, his line with patience because he knew what was so at stake for me. And so, you know, I forgive him, you know, we've got to forgive parents, but he was turning to school and he was turning to psychologists and he was turning to pediatricians and he had great insurance working for SEPTA. Um, and so he took me to every doctor, every psychologist, I mean, and they just couldn't figure out why my brain could not master reading. And there was no more motivation in the world than wanting to please my father. And so for some psychoanalyst or ABA therapist, or I had a, an adult once tell me as I was in my PhD studies, you just were not um, stimulated and um, given the proper feedback. And so I said, I believe he found experts to stimulate my brain and give me feedback loop. Um, I believe that he found lots of folks for whatever reason, the connections weren't being made. And so to like blame the therapist or blame my dad or blame the school, I don't blame anybody. I say that some kids really need intensive, rigorous and multi-year intervention, but we have to be watching the needle move some. We cannot use ineffective methods because their time is running short. And so I was very, very lucky. My whole um, middle school years, he would drive me to King of Prussia to the Linda Mood Bell facility, and he self-paid for a long time. And then somebody said, hey, do you know that like this should be happening at school? And so he worked with my school district and um, he got compensatory services for my reading instruction because he took a second job and spent a lot of time and money traveling and taking me for four and five hours of intervention a week for like four years. I mean, I, I started in seventh grade and I went through my junior year. Um, and so I, I was very, very lucky. Um, but I also had other things that went for me. So I had sports in my life and I was very, very good at sports. And I had a counselor who happened to be my field hockey coach. And he was an amazing man. Um, I believe he's retired, but it was Mike Bull and he's an amazing guy. 
And he would wager with different professionals. Like, I'm going to put her in your first period. She's going to work on her math, but we're going to call it yearbook. And then we're going to let her draw for the yearbook because I also like art and I'm a pretty decent artist. And so I drew all of the art for the yearbook for four years of my high school. And the art and the yearbook and all of that, it happened to be the teacher was the math, advanced math teacher that was over that whole kind of um you know, practice. So I would have him for first period and again, seventh period, you know, for a year. Then I had him first period and again, fourth period one year. Like, so we just structured it in a way that I could do it. And then I took advanced placement classes too. And usually there'd be four, five, six, seven kids in the class. And he would negotiate with the teacher and say, she's going to need you to read the book and work with her on the language, but she'll get, she'll get a good score. And Mm -hmm. I remember coming home, telling my dad, I'm going to take AP classes. And he said, over my dead body, he's like, you can't even, you can't even, you know, spell, how are you going to take an advanced placement test? And he goes, I don't want to waste my money on that, (laughs) you know? So, but um, I did, I took them and I got great scores. I, I took the courses and would script so much in my mind. I was also on like Olympiad or science bowl and it's all verbal. So I could absolutely with rehearsal, all those science facts and all those awesome science things, I could do that verbally. And I loved it because I was around like really smart kids, mostly boys. Um, So what high school girl doesn't like being around like a whole bunch of boys and be really geeky about stuff. Right. But no, so I, um, I just had great people that pushed me really hard and expected great things. And so that part of it, when we say about IEPs and the whole idea of IDEA, high expectations, we absolutely will go so much further if we had very high expectations for kids. So, you know, I'm a huge proponent of not leveling. We're not going to level kids. We're going to have kids, you know, heterogeneously mixed up. That's a great science word. (laughs) Um, But so um, that they can like thrive with each other. um, And we can see this big stretch because when you start to level all the research on leveling says that we end up um, really limiting kids. And so, you know, that going back to that self-contained class, having me in a self-contained class for most of sixth grade and most of seventh grade with kids that were not thriving was not a good thing for me. And so as soon as I like worked my way out and made busted out, <laughs> I, uh, I started to soar and I felt more confident too, because, um, at Pensacola high school and Pensacola middle school, I was in a PI classroom. So PI stands for perceptually impaired. Um, and so PI and Pensacola goes with Pensacola idiots too. So I had this label from the first day of, you know, middle school, from kids on my bus because I went into the only classroom in the building that had carpet. And so every other room had tile or like laminate floor. And so it was so shameful. There was only six of us marching into that room and the teacher was amazing and she was sweet and nice and knowledgeable and like a great listener, but she did not by herself singularly have enough skill to teach all seven of us, like six boys and me. Um, And There's a lot of things that happen in self-contained classrooms because of the nature of, you know, school assistants and things like that. So kids are victimized by other students that may have other impairments. Um, I was hung on a hook and left in a coat room all day long and I did not cry or do anything because I didn't want to be beat up. I didn't want anybody to know. So at the very end of the day, when all the kids were getting on the bus, somebody walked through the coat room and I was still there on a hook. And so the lady said, oh my gosh, I I remember she's an older lady, she's an aide. And she's like, oh my gosh, have you been here all day? And I said, yes, I just shook my head. And she was like, oh honey, she got me off the hook. She took me to the principal. My dad ended up coming to the school. But I mean, I just, I stayed there all day. And so, I mean, I don't know, there's things that happen that kids are re-victimized and re-victimized. And so you're living in a trauma brain in addition to already having a learning impairment. So I just, I feel like, you know, really thinking dynamically about what we do as the adults running the schools, about how things impact the children and really start to think about 
the reason why some of these privacy things are in the law about not outing somebody's disability. And it's because we want to make sure that they truly have full access and they're not being victimized and they're not being, you know, bullied. And I, I don't think people understand the depth of how much that happens because you're afraid to tell anybody because these peers are going to read victimize you, right? Like you're just, you're, you're living in a cycle of fear that you can't learn through. So I was very happy to get out of that class. So um, fun fact, I failed all my classes in, in my freshman year. So there's 365 kids in my graduating class. And I ended up my freshman year being 363 class rank. I don't know why, but I always liked looking at ranking and numbers. And so I worked really, really hard because at our high school, the first 30 kids in the yearbook got a big color picture. So I was really motivated to try to like dig myself out out of that hole and recover all those credits with grade forgiveness in summer school. And, you know, I took AP classes, so you have that extra weight. So I ended up graduating in a class of 365 kids, 32. So I missed my goal by two. Um, now, remember, I was on yearbook, so I would help to write stories and do the artwork. And so I had a really big half page color picture anyway, but I, um, and I was on the super superlatives for like most friendly or whatever, which is funny because I was always getting in trouble my whole life long and that school district for fighting. <laughs> so I'm like, how did I get most friendly? But okay. Um, but so I, I laugh that, you know, even if somebody comes in a race dead last, if we give them the support and the tools to not burn out their candle, they could come in a race first. So I just, I kind of want to wrap our conversation up with that idea that, our goal in education should be not to blow out our candle of our kids. We want to keep that passion and their excitement for waking up and coming to school. If they're coming to school and their attendance isn't completely crap, we have to preserve their fire. And so if we can do that, we can get on the other side of this. I mean, we have the science, we have the methodology we do have the resources, despite what people say, <laughs> we have the resources. Um, and we do, we have amazing people. Nobody would be in this field now, like maybe 20 years ago, I, I couldn't say this, but nobody would be in this field now for how much our, the education workforce is, is villainized. Nobody would do that willingly on the front lines of a real public school every day with all of the very many challenges if they were not about your child. So this idea that you have to go into an IEP meeting and fight, I say, let's make our, our fight really, let's be friends. Like it is going to be far better for your child sooner and quicker if we can all use that language of preserving their fire, preserving their light. And what can we do to get under this to be collectively their team, their advocates together? Because school doesn't want to mess up. There's no school I've ever been in that wakes up consciously and says, I want to screw up today. <laughs> they, they are waking up trying to figure it out. And we need to do that as partners. And so I really, I am happy with how my dad took some of the power and decided, well, I, I don't want an IEP now. And, but he still communicated and it was never fighting. He was unhappy a couple of times. He would say, no, I don't agree with you. It's okay to not agree. But where do we land is the question. So I'm okay having hard conversations with colleagues, with parents, with, but every time I'm sitting at a table, I not only wear my, I'm a dyslexic hat, but I'm here so that we can problem solve so that we can give the best possible opportunity to your child. And so if we all come back to that and I, and my heart just hurts so much for schools and for families that it, people say, I just have to fight so much. And I was like, well, let's turn down the fight and let's figure out how to preserve that child's light. Of course. I want to thank you for being so open and honest during this, this conversation. It's always enlightening to hear other people's journeys and recognize the, especially in a case like yours, the pain behind the passion, right? And recognize that with the right support, individuals with neurodiversities, whether it be a learning disability, autism, ADHD, whatever, can succeed with the right support. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for having me today and also for sharing the captions <laughs> and, you know, making sure you were so kind to say, well, Kelly, what do you need? And so I appreciate that wholeheartedly. Wonderful. Thank you.